Right then guys, it's PSL here and I'm here for the 5th episode in my Stuart Manager career mode on Grand Prix World. Last time out we had the San Marino and Argentine Grand Prix, the Argentine Grand Prix being won by Mecca Hakkinen and the San Marino Grand Prix being won by David Coulthard. Now I don't think I've shown this screen off before but this screen gives you immense detail about each of the Grand Prix that have taken place so far this season so you can see of course where everyone finished so David Coulthard won the Grand Prix despite the fact that Mecca Hakkinen took pole position because Mecca Hakkinen had a gearbox issue and then you can also see the fastest lap so Michael Schumacher actually set the fastest lap last Grand Prix oh yes and then you got the lap chart so you can actually have a look at what position every driver was in on every lap so I don't know why you would want to look through this but you can if you want and then you've also got the qualifying positions of course and the points scored as a result of that Grand Prix so of course David Coulthard won and got 10 points one thing I said in the previous episode is that I'll go through my emails to show you why my technical director and chief mechanic aren't too happy with me at the moment and why soon the morale for that department will drop if it hasn't already so I can tell you why they're not happy with me I mean the lack of on-track performance certainly doesn't help but I don't know why they would expect us to do well anyway but I know why they're really annoyed with us and that is because we haven't done enough testing in their eyes we should be doing testing after every Grand Prix but we just can't afford to do that, so, yeah, unfortunately, that's the thing, yeah, when you are a cash-strapped team, you can't afford to go testing all the time, and very quickly, that has an impact on staff morale, and, uh, yeah, and then it all just cascades from that point, but the first email has actually got some good news, and that is that we actually made a profit last Grand Prix, so that's good, but that will probably be the only email which will be positive. Yep, here we go already, my chief mechanic, testing emergency, we did no testing before this race, this is insane, how can we compete like this? Well, the short answer is, is that if we did testing, we wouldn't be competing, we wouldn't have the money to. In fact, if we went testing all the time, we genuinely wouldn't be able to afford the transportation costs to be able to compete in the Grand Prix, so that's your answer there. And then, of course, this is why the drivers don't like us, because they want us to do setup testing and oh, all this and that. So that's fun. What else is there? Manufactured more spare parts. Oh, here we go. Yes, our fuel sponsor has complained we're not doing enough fuel testing. This just gets better. Oh, great. Even my commercial department isn't too happy with me because... I haven't assigned any staff to hospitality, or in other words, VIP treatment. But that's expensive as well, so... Do these people just think we have an unlimited amount of money? The fuel suppliers. Now, I've already gone through the engine performance ratings and the tyre performance ratings, of course, with Bridgestone producing better dry tyres and Goodyear producing better wet weather tyres. I haven't gone through the fuel performance ratings. And here they are. They're not really that exciting, to be honest. Now... The best fuel suppliers are, I believe, yes, yeah, Shell and Mobil. And Shell offer two works deals and Mobil a works and partner deal. And then all other fuel suppliers, including Texaco, who we're currently with, only offer partner or customer deals. So, Shell and Mobil, if you look at their fuel, they're just bang average. Shell, middle in performance, middle in engine tolerance. Mobil, exactly the same ratings. And this goes a long way to explaining why, well I've said it earlier on this series that the best things in this game are the most well balanced. And certainly the best fuels are the most well balanced. Now of course they're the best fuels because you can get a work still and you can improve the fuels and then, then you can very quickly actually have a fuel which has got maximum performance and maximum engine tolerance. And hopefully by the end of this series we will be doing that but on the face of it, the Shell and Mobile Fuel isn't that amazing. The reason I've gone with AGIP, now this finally explains it, is the AGIP fuel is similar to the Shell and Mobile Fuel in the sense that it's fairly well balanced. 
the AGIP fuel is slightly higher on performance but slightly lower on engine tolerance. The only other fuel which is balanced, because I'd rather get a balanced fuel, but of course if I went for Shell or Mobile, I'd be competing with the top teams for that, and I I would risk not signing with a fuel supplier, and you need to sign with a fuel tyre and engine supplier. If you don't, then you fail, it's game over. Anyway, the only other fuel supply that is fairly well balanced is Repsol. Where are they? Yeah, there you go, Repsol. But Repsol are slightly higher on engine tolerance and slightly lower on performance. So that's why I said I went with AGIP based on a preference. And that is because I'd rather have a balanced fuel. I don't want to go with the top two because there's too much competition. So that just leaves AGIP or Repsol. But if there's one stat I would want to prioritise is performance. Wow, we have to spend over a quarter of a million dollars just to get to the Spanish Grand Prix. That's not great, that's just under a quarter of our remaining spending money. However, we should make a profit this Spanish Grand Prix. We certainly shouldn't make a loss, or not a significant loss anyway. We made a profit at the previous Grand Prix. Well, we'll keep an eye on our money, I mean certainly. Well, I've got, I've got plans for money. Certainly, you do have resources you can tap into to raise money mid-season, and I think we will have to do that. It's basically inevitable, to be honest. No driver raids, no incidents at the San Marino Grand Prix, because you can actually investigate for driver raids on the other teams. And in fact, let's do that. Let's take the 12% off of race scrutiny, and let's see if... I would go with Ferrari, but just for, since we're trying to get Ferrari engines, I'd rather not investigate Ferrari, even though Ferrari as a team is different to Ferrari as an engine supplier. They are completely separate entities in this game. But even despite that, let's go with McLaren. So let's see if McLaren have got, do you know what, let's see if they've got automatic gears. So we'll dedicate 12% of our mechanic staff to that. And without further ado, let's head on into the 1998 Spanish Grand Prix. Again, another cool piece of music, I like that. So, right then, of course, the competitor list. A wet Grand Prix, right. This is, I believe, the first session this season that's wet. And we're going to have the disadvantage being on the Bridgestones, but still, let's see where we qualify. Yep, you can tell instantly that we didn't do so well. And of course, it's a good cheer runner who took pole position. So, wow. Wow, wow, wow. Okay. Five people failed to make it within the 107% time. Five. Both Minardis, both Tyrrells, and surprisingly, Olivier Panis. And the really worrying thing is that Jan Magnussen only just made it within the 107% time. He was half a tenth ahead of it. But the thing is, is that the FIA, sometimes the FIA will decide that those people who didn't qualify will still take part in the race. And honestly, I would have expected, with five cars not qualifying, that the FIA would have been lenient and allowed them to race, or at least allowed some of them to race. But no, the FIA has decided that none of those drivers, including Olivier Panis and the Prost, will be allowed to take part in the Spanish Grand Prix. Magnussen, yeah, Magnussen didn't do so well. Now, I've been defending Magnussen a lot, one thing I will say about Magnussen is, of course, his driver ratings aren't good, that's a given, but even despite that, he does often excel his driver ratings. Not in wet weather conditions. I think there is, I think each driver does have a wet weather stat, which is why Barrichello's done so well, because Barrichello's wet weather stat is reasonably good. I think it might even be one of his better ones, possibly. Either way, each driver has a wet weather stat. I know Barrichello's isn't bad, but Magnussen, all of his stats are bad, and 
whilst in dry conditions he can fluke a good result, in wet conditions that's, yeah, that isn't really the case. So that's why, that's why he damn nearly didn't even qualify for the Spanish Grand Prix. Luckily he did. Barrichello though did very well beating Johnny Herbert. And Johnny Herbert is driving for Sauber and on Goodyear tyres. Herbert's a Williams driver next season. Let's not forget Johnny Herbert's assigned with Williams. So's Olivier Panis. Panis will be driving for Williams next season. I suspect as a test driver, but still. I bet Williams are regretting that now, seeing that Panis couldn't even qualify within the 107 percent time. But anyway, towards the front, Michael Schumacher took pole position. And look at it. He took pole position by over two seconds. Two seconds a lap. No wonder five people failed to make it with any 107% time, Michael Schumacher dominated qualifying. And Michael Schumacher is good in wet weather conditions. I know he was in real life, so I assume that his wet weather stat is very good in this game as well. Well, all of his driving stats are very good in this game, so Michael Schumacher, I'm not that surprised that he took pole position, but to take pole position by over two seconds a lap, from David Coulthard in second, that is quite a surprise. And Damon Hill qualified in third, beating Eddie Irvine. And then you got Mika Hakkinen on the Bridgestones in fifth. Yeah, Benetton, they've been harmed because they're on the Bridgestones with Vert in sixth and Fizzy Keller in seventh. But even despite that, they still beat both Williams with Heinz Hardfrenson in eighth and Jacques Villeneuve all the way down in twelfth. Jacques Villeneuve was beaten by Pedro Diniz in qualifying. So it may have been a wet qualifying session, but it will be a dry race. So we'll see how that affects the order, if at all. And anyway, Barrichello, that's all fine. We don't want to change the assembly or the pit stop strategy, so... Okay, right, it was a Ferrari 1-2, Michael Schumacher winning the Spanish Grand Prix from pole position, and he won it by 27 seconds. That's quite a lead, that really is. So Barrichello in 10th, Magnussen in 12th, let's look further down the order. Of course, only 17 runners, I kind of forgot about that. In fact, actually, no, I was correct in that, I said 17 runners when I meant 17 starters, but actually, even come the end of the Grand Prix, it was 17 runners. Every single person who started this Grand Prix finished it. So there you go, that is really rare actually. Barrichello in 10th, that's pretty decent, beating Jean Alesi in the Grand Prix. Magnussen in 12th, beating Pedro Diniz. Yeah, and we did as well as we realistically could. Pretty much anyway, I mean, to be honest, we wouldn't be beating the Benettons, Williams, Ferraris and McLarens, and we shouldn't really be beating the Jordans, to be honest, although it can be done on the odd occasion. And in fact, yeah, Damon Hill, Damon Hill did so well in qualifying. Damon Hill qualified in third, but finished in 15th. No idea what happened there, but anyway, in the 1998 Spanish Grand Prix, Michael Schumacher won by 27 seconds from Eddie Irvine in second. In fact, Eddie Irvine's position was a lot less secure than Michael Schumacher's because Eddie Irvine finished in second by only half a second. Mick Arkinen was quite a way back from Fizzy Keller, but he did still make up a position from qualifying to finish in fourth. Jacques Villeneuve made up a lot of positions from 12th on the starting grid to finish in fifth come the end of the Grand Prix with Heinzeld Frentzen in the other, Williams finishing in 6th, and David Coulthard somehow didn't score a point, despite the fact he qualified in 2nd, so actually there was a lot of movement from the end of qualifying to the end of the race. In the Drivers' Championship, that now means Eddie Irvine is the Drivers' Championship leader, one point ahead of Mick Ackerman. Michael Schumacher is finally starting to come into play 
on 17 points, less than 10 behind the championship leader, which is now his teammate. Fizzy Keller is still in fourth ahead of David Coulthard, with Jacques Villeneuve and Heinzald Frentz and the two Williams drivers in joint sixth. Then you got Wurtz in eighth place with nine points, a fair way ahead of Pedro Diniz, Damon Hill and Mika Salo, who have all got either two or one point to their name. In the Constructors' Championship, Ferrari are now leading it, five points ahead of McLaren, and finally, it has turned into a Ferrari-McLaren battle. Right then, let's have a look at the post-Spanish Grand Prix news. So, it's all about Michael Schumacher and Ferrari, we already know about that, let's move on. Right, more Ferrari news, this is interesting. Ferrari has signed a landmark works deal with Ferrari. Now this is what I mean, because Ferrari, as I said earlier on, Ferrari the Formula 1 team are completely separate from Ferrari the engine supplier. Ferrari really do have to go through the motions of assigning some of their commercial staff and doing VIP treatment to convince Ferrari the engine supplier to supply Ferrari engines to Ferrari the Formula 1 team. It's ridiculous, I know it's ridiculous, but Otherwise, Ferrari could just sign engines with themselves incredibly easily and it would mean that managing Ferrari would be so easy. It means that Ferrari would be the easiest team to manage in the game because you can have guaranteed Ferrari engines without putting in any of your commercial staff. So, yeah, anyway, Ferrari have got a works deal with Ferrari. Does that make sense? Although, I mean, it could have been worse. Ferrari could have signed a deal with... Ford, let's say, or Mercedes, um, although Mercedes would make sense because Mercedes make better engines, um, I was kind of hoping that Ferrari would sign a deal with Ford, let's say, but, well that could still happen in a future season, I'm looking out for it, and anyway, we still haven't heard what Ron Dennis is up to, and we all know from my F1 Manager series that Ron Dennis is mad, so... I'm still looking forward to the McLaren news. Well, we know McLaren have kept David Coulthard, which is fairly sensible. Anyway, uh, Stewart, I don't care. My drivers may be concerned that we're too slow. I don't know why they expected so much from us. Arrows! Arrows have signed Alexander Wurtz. That's a fantastic deal, actually, for Arrows, because Wurtz has been fantastic this season. In fact, both Benetton drivers have done extraordinarily well. Even Giancarlo Fisichella has done really well. So, there you go. Alexander Wurtz has signed a deal with Arrows. That's really good for Arrows. I don't know why Wurtz has agreed to go with them, but... Well, someone needs to replace Mika Salo, since Salo is going to Tyrrell. Eddie Irvine has agreed to race with Benetton. Right, that was actually rumoured post San Marino. Benetton said they were confident of agreeing a deal with Eddie Irvine, and... It turns out a rumour actually came true. Jordan has got Stefano Domenicali, right. Okay, so I don't actually know how highly rated Stefano Domenicali is. I would assume he's going to be at least 4-star rated, potentially 5-star rated. But still, Stefano Domenicali is one of, if not the best, commercial manager in the game. And Jordan have snapped him up. Ricardo Rosset has bought a seat with Minardi, of course, Ricardo Rosset being a pay driver. There are a few pay drivers in this game. It is uh, Ricardo Rosset, Shinji Nakano, Esteban Tuero, Toro Takaki, so basically all of Minardi's and Tyrrell's drivers. And then the other pay driver is Pedro Diniz. And Pedro Diniz is the highest skilled pay driver and also the one who pays the most. During pit stop's last race, surprisingly little brake dust came away from the Ferrari cars. That means I believe that Ferrari have got a driver aid. Well, let me just check, hang on. So, oh, of course, Jean Todd won manager of the month. How unpredictable. In fact, no, of course, that's completely predictable, isn't it? Um, and Ken Tyrrell won worst F1 manager. I feel like that's fairly predictable as well, right? I don't know why I get excited for manager of the month. Um, okay, so during pit stops, Ferrari... Right, okay, let's, um... Let's see if... 
Ferrari have actually... Oh, okay, right. Now, whenever you produce a driver aid, let me show you. So, whenever you produce a driver aid, because we are part way to producing or designing our active suspension driver aid, you can, there are two options, you can either run it by the FIA and then construct it, or you can just construct it. Now, it is a risk reward thing because if you run it by the FIA and they say it's legal and it's fine, then it's fine. You can always run it and there you go, that will be a driver aid that lasts for life. However, sometimes the FIA will go around and go, no, actually, we don't think that's legal, we're not going to approve it. So, and then of course, all that design work has been wasted, so that's why running it by the FIA is risky, but if they accept it, it's better in the long term. But as you can see on this screen, the FIA has not approved any driver aids. So Ferrari are clearly running a driver aid that they haven't run past the FIA, so Ferrari are doing something very, very sneaky, which isn't too surprising, actually, but... Right, we're going to have to investigate that. I'll get back onto that just before we head to Monaco, but... That's some very interesting news, and I'll tell you what, that is journalists doing a job that I want them to do. Reporting on the other teams doing illegal things. That's good news. There you go. That's why I want the journalists to be there, not awarding stupid manager of the month awards. I don't care about that. Oh yes, this is fantastic news. We have filled up the deal completion bar for the partner deal with Ferrari. So we can now sign that deal and we will get Ferrari engines next season on a partner deal. So let's sign that. It's only for one year, but there you go. A partner deal with the second best engines. Ford themselves have given us an upgraded engine, so of course we've got the standard Model 1 engine with the XX, that just means it's generic. Then there's ST, the abbreviation for Stuart, so that's the second model and one we worked on, hence the ST. Then the third model, the fourth model is an XX, that's one provided by Ford. In fact, let me just check, have we... What, what, uh, have, what bonuses have we got with Ford? Have we got one that... Okay, we have got a fast engine upgrade bonus with Ford. Okay, that explains it. So, Ford have given us a new engine. Let's see, how does it compare to the one we developed? It's more powerful, less reliable, and... Okay, so it's higher on fuel and higher on power, but less reliable. Do you know what? I'm going to go with that, actually. I am going to go with... Ford's engine because it's better on fuel so that's just an improvement but also it's better on power and honestly I would take the extra point in power you know for over the point on reliability because it doesn't really matter well it does matter if we finish a race Ford's sponsor negotiations but now that we've got the Ferrari deal sewn up I'm not too fast anymore to be honest so yeah we'll take the more powerful engine because that is a performance boost Oh yes, right, so Ferrari, last Grand Prix, there wasn't much, there wasn't much brake dust coming from their cars, so, it's probably power brakes, isn't it? It's probably power brakes, right, I think Ferrari have got a power brakes driver aid, so, let me just check, do we, no we didn't discover anything last Grand Prix, so I think, and, well, I mean, I know Ferrari as a team is a separate entity to the engine supply, but especially now we've already done a deal with Ferrari, let's investigate Ferrari and see if they're doing anything untoward. And I think they are, and I think we're going to be the team that uncovers them. So there you go, so we're going to assign only 12%, but still, 12% of our mechanic staff to have a look at Ferrari, see if they've got a power brakes driver aid. And yes, anyway, so, let's head on into the 1998 Monaco Grand Prix. Okay, not that well. Although, it is basically the best we can hope for. 
13th and 14th in qualifying. Everyone actually successfully qualified for this Grand Prix. And we beat Sauber in qualifying. Jan Magnussen beat Barrichello, which is a shock, but also both Magnussen and Barrichello beat Alessi and Herbert. Well, there you go. That is, that is a surprise. I have to say Sauber haven't done this well. Well, no, sorry. I don't think Sauber have done as well as I would have expected them to have because Sauber, Sauber should be plainly quicker than us. And Jordan, I think, have underperformed as well. Jordan are scrapping with arrows. I mean, Arrows have got three times as many points as Jordan in the Constructors' Championship. It's, it's honestly baffling. But anyway, Mika Hakkinen took pole position for the 1998 Monaco Grand Prix with Michael Schumacher in second, Eddie Irvine third, Jacques Villeneuve fourth, Giancarlo Fizzi Keller in fifth, and David Coulthard in sixth with Frentzen and Wurtz in seventh and eighth. So then, it's forecast to be a dry Monaco Grand Prix. And let's head on into it. We don't want to change the race strategy. I've never done that, but I wonder whether a one-stop would work around Monaco. In theory, it would be better, but I'm not sure if it's actually viable. Well, I'm not going to change it because I never have changed the race strategy. So then, I really hope a lot of cars retire because we might sneak a point. Unless, of course, our guys retire. Well, let's see. In fact, actually, there weren't as many retirements as I was hoping for. I mean, only 13 drivers actually finished. Barrichello went out with a hydraulics issue. Eddie Irvine retired with an engine failure. Everyone who finished in the top six is fairly predictable. Mika Salo, though, damn nearly snuck another point this season. But Mika Akinen won the 1998 Monaco Grand Prix, five seconds ahead of Michael Schumacher in second. Alexander Wurtz, another fantastic performance and another podium finish. Third place around Monaco, 11 seconds ahead of David Coulthard in fourth. Mika Hakkinen has now got a nine point lead in the Drivers' Championship and ahead of Eddie Irvine. Wow, it is close at the top. McLaren are leading the Constructors' Championship but by only two points. Ferrari are on 48 points, McLaren on 50. It is very close at the top of the Constructors' Championship and still fairly close in the battle for third place. Benetton have got 31 points and they're only eight points ahead of Williams in fourth. And then, of course, you've got Arrows who have got three points and Jordan with one point and then every other team, including Sauber, still hasn't scored a point. So then, let's see if we uncovered Ferrari's power brakes. Yes, we did, right. Okay, we've got a choice now. We can either complain to the FIA and get those power brakes removed, or we can copy. Now, the thing is, though, is as much as this is a success, it's unlikely that anything will really come of this. Now here's the thing, we could click copy and of course that would be the better option for us because that means we would get their power brakes. But I reckon if we click copy and I, I don't know what determines this but I think it might be our chief designer's rating and our chief designer is only two star rated. But I think if we click copy there is a good chance that the game will just say oh you don't have the ability, you don't have the the technical skill to be able to copy their brakes and then it's a waste so complaining would be the better option although that wouldn't help our relationship with Ferrari but as I said Ferrari is different from Ferrari because that makes perfect sense but yes Ferrari we could complain because of course Ferrari haven't submitted those power brakes to the FIA so we could complain and then get Ferrari fined or get those power brakes removed. Yeah, I mean, I would copy their power brakes, but I don't think we'd be successful. And I think it's more likely we would be successful complaining. So let's do that. And of course, yes. Yeah, I didn't think this would work. Yeah, the FIA has not found any infringement of technical regulations. Your complaint has been rejected. So basically, because I assume... Yeah, I mean... They still haven't been formally approved by the FIA, but I think what that means, basically what that means is that 
we forced an inspection. Clearly, Ferrari, they designed those power brakes and didn't get the FIA to inspect them. But what all we did there was force the FIA inspection. And clearly, the FIA just went, now they're fine. So then, let's have a quick look at the post-Monaco Grand Prix news. Because there is nine pages of news. So there's a lot that happened. So let's quickly skim through all of it. So... One big news is that Benetton have completed a team sponsorship deal with Blondes. Now that's really screwed over Prost. I don't think Prost can really get a team sponsor deal next year. Well, they, oh, maybe they could, but they've been so poor this season. Honestly, they might be able to get a team sponsor deal purely based on the fact they were okay last season. Possibly, but... Anyway, I mean, Benetton have gone with their team sponsor, so that's that's really screwed over Prost. I will be surprised, though, if Prost get a team sponsor. We deserve to get one. We're better than Prost. Um, although, to be fair, actually, Arrows really do deserve to get a team sponsor because Arrows this season have done really well. So then, Barrichello didn't look happy. Yeah, the other. In fact, what was that at the bottom? Oh, McLaren have just taken the lead in the Constructors' Championship. Williams will be buying fuel from Petrobras. Jan Magnussen, I'm going to ignore this, Jan Magnussen has admitted publicly that he is disappointed with the team this year, even though even though he nearly scored a point. I don't know why everyone at our team expects us to be doing better than we are. Anyway, so that's that. Oh, and Barrichello's disappointed, he can go do one. Stewart, of course, we've gone into a partnership with Ferrari. In fact, that rumour has been confirmed, Ferrari has signed Giancarlo Fizzi Keller. So there you go, Minardi have got Jarno Trulli. So that means Minardi's driver lineup next year is Ricardo Rosset and Jarno Trulli. Actually, overall, that's not too bad of a driver lineup, to be perfectly honest. I mean, Ricardo Rosset, I think, is one of the better paid drivers, and Jarno Trulli's not bad, so. Honestly, it's actually probably not even that bad of a deal for Jarno Trulli because. Prost aren't exactly much better than Minardi, so Trulli's just moved from one bad team to a less well-funded bad team. Rubens Barrichello has agreed to race for McLaren. Earlier on this episode, I said I was looking forward to the deals that McLaren were going to do because in my F1 Manager series, Ron Dennis went mad. But here... That's actually quite a good deal. It's a fantastic deal for Rubens Barrichello. But it's actually quite a good deal for McLaren. Because as I said right at the start of this season. Rubens Barrichello is probably the best value for money driver in the game. He's really highly skilled. And not that expensive. In fact that really does beg the question. What's happening to Hakkinen? In my F1 Manager series... Hakkinen just got dumped, Ron Dennis didn't want him anymore, and then, well, no one signed Hakkinen. I think that's going to happen here, actually, because I think Williams has signed, the, yeah, Williams has signed all their drivers, so have Ferrari, so have McLaren. That just leaves Benetton. They're probably the only other team that can actually afford to get Mika Hakkinen, so... It does look like Mick Hakkinen won't be racing next season, which is extraordinary. I've had a look through the rest of the post-Monaco news, and to be honest, most of it isn't really interesting. It's just cash sponsors being signed, mostly. And other parts of it, it will be better if I discuss that in the next episode, because, well, it's more driver aid news, so I'll talk about that in the next episode. So... I hope you guys enjoyed this episode, if you did be sure to leave a like, comment down below and I'll see you guys in the next episode where, amongst other things, I'll be talking about the rest of the post Monaco news, heading into the Canadian Grand Prix. So, I'll see you guys then.